I am back. For months, I've been engulfed inside of a gargantuan ooze. I've been struggling and striving, and at last I have broken free and cast down the all-consuming slime that seemed to have endless amounts of hit points. And upon emerging, what do I find? A new Draconomicon. Well, sort of. Fizban's Treasury of Dragons features a 63-page bestiary of new dragons, dragon kin, and dragon-related creatures. It's a lot of draconic monsters, but are they worth their weight in gold, or do they fizzle out? As usual, my ranking here is going to look at both the small details and the bigger picture. Each creature will be rated in five attributes. Mechanics, how fun, dynamic, and unique are monsters' abilities. Style, how inspiring is the monster's appearance, art, and overall tone. Role-playing, does the monster engage with the characters through dialogue or social interactions? Lore, does the monster have an interesting ecology, backstory, or adventure hooks? And versatility, how flexible and variable is the monster? These attribute scores will be added together to give us an overall rating of the monster's tier. F through S tier, actually. Before we dive in, I have to mention my recently launched 5 e book, Esper's Emporium of Esoterica. It is a massive 350-page tome full of content for both players and game masters. It includes an original class, the Paragon, options for other classes as well, two new races, spells, feats, magic items, cursed items, magic shops, traps, GM advice, and over 170 new monsters and NPCs including ones such as the Astral Dragon and the Orb Dragon. At the moment, the digital version is available on PDF, and soon there will be a hardcover version available as well. Check out esperthebard.com to get your copy. The link is down in the video description. Now, we welcome Fizban the Fabulous and his seven canaries. Let's see what draconic beings he has detailed in his volume. Starting off with F tier. Egg hunters are tiny, parasitic bugs that specifically eat the insides from dragon eggs and implant their own young inside. The concept is cool in a way, I would say, but I do find it hard to believe as dragons could so easily discover these caterpillar salamander monstrosities. Something that is a dragon parasite needs a way to more cleverly and effectively avoid the dragon's notice. What, with their blind sight and expertise in perception and magic and immense protectiveness and so on. Also, I don't imagine dragon eggs look like this. These are dragon eggs. These are cartoon dinosaur eggs. Also, also, the egg hunter hatchling is a tiny sized bug who has a little egg tooth, but its bite deals the same damage as a great sword. So, hmm. This creature has a nugget of potentially cool concept in there, but it needs more time in the incubator. That's it for F tier. Just a tiny little bump up into low D tier is the Egg Hunter Adult. This is the full grown specimen whose abdomen or tail can swell up to look like a dragon's egg, fooling the dragon that somehow doesn't know how many eggs it laid. It has a torpor spores ability that releases what the flavor text describes as spores that make other creatures lethargic allowing the egg hunter to scurry to safety. Well, the odds that a dragon will fail the con save are low to impossible. Unless it's a wormling, which I don't think wormlings would be laying eggs anyhow. If the egg hunter somehow pulls off the torpor spores, the dragon or whatever affected creature is poisoned for one minute with ongoing saves and while poisoned, it cannot take reactions and it cannot take both an action and a bonus action. So in other words, a dragon can still use the breath attack, it can still multi-attack the egg hunter. I like the concept of a parasite that is specialized to counteract or even prey upon dragons and their eggs, but the egg hunter, I just don't buy it. Contrast with the egg hunter is the horde scarab, another bug, which I do think works just fine and well. In this case, it's more symbiotic with dragons. It's low tier only because it's ultimately a very simple monster, but it's good for what it is. It's a beetle-like, tiny creature that can hold still to pose as treasure, and it comes in both a single scarab version and a swarm. They are low CR monstrosities whose bites inflict disadvantage on the target's own attack rolls, 
and they can also release a glitter dust that negates invisibility and alerts dragons within one mile to the target's location. So, simple monster, but very cool for what it is. Also, it reminds me of a creature from my own book, interestingly, the Aurapede. It can retract its legs and its head to appear just like a gold coin, and when adventurers pick it up, it eventually latches onto them and has this numbing bite. So that caught my attention. The Lion Drake is our next specimen. It's another fairly simple monster. It's technically a monstrosity, not a dragon. It blends a brass dragon and a lion. I actually like the side art better with the less exaggerated neck and the bigger head with the full mane. The primary art does look kind of goofy and cartoonish. The Lion Drake, aka the Dragon, it flies, it perceives, it bites and claws, it also has a blood chilling roar that frightens other creatures. And if the creature fails its wisdom save by five or more, it's actually paralyzed with fear. It's nothing too complex, but it's pretty nice for what it is and the beast-like predator role that it has in the world is fine enough. The only real WTF moment that I had was that it's based on lions and brass dragons, yet it's solitary. Lions are social group animals, and brass dragons are perhaps the most social and conversational of all dragons. So for a solitary predator hybrid, I think it would have been better as a tiger plus a white dragon. Next is the animated breath, which I did not care for it, not really at all. Objectively, it ranks at mid D tier, but subjectively, I would have rather have tossed it into the F tier return to cinder bin. The concept of a dragon's breath weapon becoming a creature isn't outright bad or anything. I suppose it works as well as anything else in a ultra high magic setting. A dragon does have magical breath, so perhaps it could coalesce or it could get animated due to the innate elemental spirit that the dragon somehow channels. But in this case, the animated breath's abilities are so plain and so boring. And it's CR6, the actual elemental creatures, the main elementals, fire elemental, water elemental, etc., are CR5. They have a classic place in the game. They have better aesthetics. They have more interesting abilities. So why the animated breath has to one-up them by one CR and then come in with a more generic and simpler version, I don't know. I would just use the core elemental creatures instead. The only animated breath that I do kind of like is the lightning breath. It does have this teleport ability. It could zap about or kind of jaunt around and give these jolts to enemies whenever it does so. So combat-wise, I think it does function well as a skirmisher or a mobility monster, which those are always pretty fun. Not the Dragon, but the Dragonelle. This creature is our next one. It is classified as a dragon, or at least a dragon kin. It's sort of like a drake, but it is six-limbed like the true dragons in D&D. They are essentially simpler, less intelligent dragons without breath attacks. They're often raised to be flying mounts. Nothing amazing, but Nothing terrible, just a plain monster creature with claw attacks and flyby. Eh. Oh, and just a nitpick on the artwork here. The rider won't be able to use that sword in combat. It just won't reach the opponent. And the position that it's crouching in with one hand grasping a strap and the other one holding its sword, I don't know, that doesn't seem very stable. I think a better choice would have been a lance or even a hand crossbow I think could work. That tops out D tier, and now we move on to C tier, which are either all around medium quality creatures or creatures that have a mix of great aspects with lame aspects. The Gym Stalker has a pretty unique origin. Coming from a Gym Dragon slaying an aberration and then repurposing the corpse with growing crystals, the Gym Stalker becomes a guardian, scout, and hunter that patrols, particularly on the lookout for aberrations. You see, gym dragons are associated with psionics, and good aligned or even neutral aligned psionic creatures are often associated with fighting against evil aberrations. It's been that way at least since the 4E lore established that paradigm. The gym stalker can spider climb, transfer to itself portions of damage that its nearby allies suffer, and communicate with telepathy. It attacks with claws and thrown psi crystals that have secondary effects, based upon what variety of gym dragon created it. 
It's a pretty cool monster. It doesn't fully manifest its potential, but I do like it. As a quick tangent, the body shape of it sort of reminds me of the Dracotars. They are from the fantastic third edition book, Monster Manual 3. They, as of yet, have not made a comeback, which I had kind of expected them to appear in this book. Alas, no. Okay, take a look at this creature here. Just as a D&D player or a gamer in general, what would you call this creature? Dragon Skeleton? Dracolich? Well, believe it or not, it is the Dragonbone Golem. Probably the least golem-looking golem I've ever seen. This is actually a construct made by a dragon out of the bones of other dragons it has defeated. It's held together by adamantine wire, which is pretty weird. I've heard of adamantine weapons and adamantine armor, but wire? It's a little too mundane for something as prestigious and magical as adamantine. Also, adamantine is described as being extremely non-flexible. It's notoriously difficult to work with, which is why typical smiths effectively cannot forge adamantine items, but rather it has to be worked by mage smiths, artificers, wizards, and the like. A dragonbone golem has a fear aura, a claw and pinion attacks, and a petrifying breath, which I have to give a nod of respect to because it's pretty hardcore. It's a permanent petrification effect after two failed con saves. It also has magic resistance, which might be the only monster in the whole book that does. Apparently Fizban is allergic to magic resistance. Even the gods in here don't have magic resistance, we'll get to those later. We now come to the Dracohydra. This amalgam monstrosity is a cross between chromatic dragons and a hydra, created by a powerful arcane ritual. This is typically done by a wizard or high-level cultist who worships Tiamat. The result is a huge-sized creature that kind of resembles Tiamat herself with multiple dragon heads. It ravages countrysides and towns, devouring animals, people, pretty much any other creature. Or the creator might have it bound to following his command. Like with typical Hydra monsters in 5e, the Dracohydra's heads can get destroyed and then two more grow back for each destroyed one. It also breathes a prismatic breath in which all of the heads breathe together. The weird thing is that unlike the actual prismatic spells in which you roll on a table of different damage types and effects, the Dracohydra just chooses the damage type whenever it breathes and there are no secondary effects. This is kind of disappointing as random tables are so much fun. Plus, it's weird because the Dracohydra can have white dragon heads breathing fire or blue dragon heads breathing poison gas, and so on. Also, it's not immune nor resistant to its own breath damage. So, how does it not destroy its own throat or mouth when breath attacking? This creature is really stylish. I quite like the concept, but the execution feels underdeveloped. Metallic sentinels are sapient constructs created by metallic dragons, using the creator's own type of metal. Sentinels come in a medium humanoidish variety and a tiny bird-like variety. I feel like a broken record here, but yet again we find a pretty cool concept that just didn't get developed well enough. For one, this looks nothing related to dragons. Rather, it looks like something straight out of the Magic the Gathering Kaladesh setting. I wouldn't be surprised if it was concept art or maybe something left over from that set. Second, the vaguely humanoid-shaped sentinel, called Metallic Peacekeepers, are supposed to be dedicated to diffusing tensions that could spiral into violence, yet they have plus zero charisma and no proficiency in persuasion. Dialogue and diplomacy is one of the main ways to keep people from breaking down into violence. The lore goes on to say that they dwell in towns, blending in with the populace in humanoid form, yet they have no ability to change into a humanoid form, or any other forms. It has a Calming Mist, which is a 30-foot radius that is resisted with a Charisma saving throw. An affected creature is charmed, incapacitated, and reduced to speed of zero. This incapacitating charm straight up lasts for one minute. No ongoing saves, damage does not break the affected creature out. This actually incentivizes the so-called non-violent peacekeeper and its allies to attack charmed creatures. 
the subjects are just reduced to being helpless. I can't think of many things at all in 5e that if you fail one single saving throw, you're completely stunlocked for one minute. A further strange point is that all metallic sentinels are immune to fire. Shouldn't the damage immunity be based on the type of metal used to create it? Like if a bronze dragon creates a bronze sentinel, why is it immune to fire instead of lightning? If we take things purely at face value, the metallic sentinel is fine, it works just well enough as a mid C tier monster, but as soon as we examine it closely, it comes off as half baked. In relieving contrast is the Dragon Blood Ooze, which functions perfectly well as a mid tier monster. It's an ooze that comes into being from a dragon's blood in an arcane laboratory or alchemist workshop. Perhaps it's an accident, perhaps it's spontaneous, perhaps it's a result of mad experimentation. It's a simple creature doing what oozes do best, glooping along, attacking with its own slimy body, even trying to hold the shape of a dragon at times and spewing acid gel instead of a true breath attack. Draconians originated from the world of Kryn, better known as the Dragonlance setting. They look very much like winged dragonborn, and it does get a little awkward having both Draconians and dragonborn in the same setting together. Another key difference is that Draconians come from actual dragon eggs, which are magically altered, and when a Draconian dies, it explodes in a blast of magical power. As you can imagine, it's usually some wicked ruler who's creating Draconians for the purpose of raising a powerful army. The Draconian foot soldier is the most common and plentiful kind of Draconian, with a mere CR one half. It's kind of weird that a dragon egg could produce monsters that, when full grown, are the same CR as basic lizard folk. The foot soldier comes from the eggs of brass, crystal, and white dragons, which are the least powerful of the true dragons. The draconian foot soldier has a basic weapon attack, its wings only serve to give it slow fall, and when it dies, it releases a small burst of petrifying gas. Though in the worst case scenario, a target will be petrified for a maximum of one minute. The foot soldier is a decent enough monster, it functions fine for what it is. There are more draconians, but we're going to get to them here in just a little bit. And back to janky town we go with the Dragonflesh Grafter and its advanced form, the Dragonflesh Abomination. This creature begins as a humanoid, an ogre, a troll, I don't know, nothing in the lore says so. The base creature stitches on, implants, or ingests dragon body parts as an obsessive attempt to become dragon-like. Is this process a series of magic rituals? Are there spells for this? Or is the person sawing off his feet and stitching on dead dragon's feet in place? Ah. The resulting grafter is a large monstrosity that attacks with a great club, like an ogre, but how could an ogre perform such advanced and improbable magical surgery? Uh, it spews acidic bile as a kind of pseudo breath weapon. The advanced version, the Abomination, is nearly fully a dragon and it has a couple additional features like a poisonous aura, an acid spit range attack, and a tail attack. If we look past the crudely cobbled lore, the main problem here is that this should not have been a generalized catch-all creature but rather a template to put on top of an existing monster with a couple of examples in the book. We could have an ogre transformed by a powerful dragon mage who performed rituals along with this mad surgery, thus getting the green dragon or black dragon grafted template that adds a few features and traits and increases the CR by one, maybe two. Or how about a minotaur grafted with red dragon flesh? or a kobold chieftain grafted with blue dragon body parts. I know it's viable enough for a DM to implement these developments, and I do encourage that kind of creative tinkering. The frustration comes from the fact that I don't always have the time, the energy, and the interest to be fixing everything that's underdeveloped in the entries. If we pay $50 for a book, there is an unspoken agreement that whoever produced the book has taken the time to get things right, or as close to right as possible. Next up we have the Dragon Followers. They compose a general NPC section of the book. I say section, but really it's just two pages with three NPCs. The Dragon Blessed, Dragon Chosen, and Dragon Speaker. There could have easily been more dragon-themed NPCs, but this is what we got, and they're not bad. 
The dragon blessed, as the name implies, is the divine-themed one, a dragon cleric or dragon priest. It has a mace that deals a bunch of radiant damage, a radiant bolt, cantrip type attack, and some typical cleric spells. There's nothing very unique here, it's pretty much a standard mid-level NPC cleric, and for whatever wacky reason, there's actually nothing dragon-themed to this NPC's abilities. It could have been called Blessed of Paylor or Sun Priest, and no one would have known. So that is a letdown. It should have had some kind of divine dragon spell. And let's talk about her mace attack for a second. It deals an extra 4d8 radiant damage on a hit. Where exactly does the 4d8 radiant damage come from? It's passive, every single hit deals it. No class feature in the whole game can match that. It's like an artifact weapon power level, or a very high level spell that lasts forever and it can't be dispelled and doesn't require concentration. Does Bahamut himself impart this epic level boon? The lore just says that the dragon blessed revere dragons as gods. Outside of a god, there isn't even any dragon that has this kind of ability for itself, let alone being able to give it to other people. Why would a CR5 NPC have a divine boon more powerful than even that of a 20th level player character. Do you want to know the answer? The answer is, the extra 4d8 radiant damage on every hit was given by whoever designed the stat block so that the NPC would deal the desired amount of damage per round as prescribed by the monster creation guidelines. So it's a case of mechanics taking priority over story and world building, which I regard as a mistake. If the story is full of holes, and the world building is inconsistent, then everything starts to lose its meaning. Moving on to the dragon chosen, this is the warrior type, which slightly has a dragon theme going on. She has natural armor in the form of dragon scales. That's a little something, even though tons of non-dragons also have natural armor. And here we go, if she throws her hand axe, it magically returns to her. Because take a look at this, See those floating, hovering bits of vibrantly colored crystal at the extremities of the weapon? Like something out of a video game or a kid's animation? Yeah, that's a little preview of what's to come. That's how you know. It's psionic. The third NPC is the Dragon Speaker. In this case, a green-haired gnome with a hurdy-gurdy. He's basically a bard NPC and again, doesn't have any draconic abilities but the stat block does work well enough for what it is. He has some bard spells, a thunderbolt spell attack that I guess is supposed to be draconic, but feels more like an elemental mage blast. The disarming words reaction can subtract 1d6 from an enemy damage roll three times per day. It's a cool flavor, but a pretty piddly effect. If it were me giving feedback during the design phase, I'd say lose the crazy mace attack from the cleric and give her a spell that conjures a dragon spirit. For the warrior, play more into those dragon scales, like resisting damage types associated with dragons, maybe a shield made from a big dragon scale, some kind of dragon breath that also imbues her weapon for a time. And the bard could speak draconic words of power that produce effects similar to the dragon's layer actions or even regional effects. So you get the idea. The NPCs here work well enough. They just need more flavor, more theme appropriate abilities. We now stumble upon the Horde Mimic. The standard mimic appears as one medium sized object, such as a treasure chest, a door, a chair, etc. Now imagine a huge sized mimic that appears as an entire treasure hoard. It's diabolic. It's also significantly stronger than the base Mimic, which that one is not a very strong monster at all. The Horde Mimic can attack with extremely sticky pseudopods and a powerful bite. It also has a Caustic Mist that deals acid damage and blinds. Due to its very low versatility, the Mimic is a one-trick pony, but it's a hella cool one-trick pony and an unforgettable monster. In B tier, we are going to continue seeing plot holes, janky bits, and disappointing style choices, but with these creatures, their upsides overall outweigh their downsides. In low B tier, we come back to the Draconians, the humanoid-esque draconic monstrosities that are magically spawned from dragon eggs. Draconian infiltrators are made from copper, black, and topaz dragon eggs, 
and as their name suggests, they are the stealthy ones. They have a dagger attack that is imbued with poison from some unknown, unmentioned, mysterious source. I guess just their own innate power. Their wings are not enough to provide actual flight, but they can do controlled glides if they fall or if they jump from some height. When an infiltrator dies, it turns into a puddle of acid that splashes onto nearby creatures. Does the puddle of acid remain on the ground in like a 15 foot diameter area that becomes hazardous terrain? The stat block doesn't say so, but maybe so, maybe for one minute. The next draconian in the ranking is the Dreadnought, which is the large sized draconian and one of the stronger ones. It's a bit strange to call a CR4 creature a Dreadnought. It's a stylish creature with my favorite art of all the Draconians in this book. A Dreadnought comes from a silver, blue, or sapphire egg, yet it bursts into flames when it dies. Hmm. In combat, it's a fairly straightforward brute with dual-wielding sword attacks and a club tail that can knock targets prone. Its wings are fully functional, providing a 60-foot flying speed, and its most interesting and versatile ability is Shape Theft, which allows it to take on the appearance of any creature that it kills. Draconian mages come from bronze, green, and emerald dragon eggs, and wield a few noteworthy arcane powers. Their wings are the gliding kind, like the infiltrators, and when they die, they explode, dealing force damage in a 10-foot radius. The Draconian mage lore states that they often lead squads of Draconian foot soldiers and use their magic to snipe across the battlefield. Yet their only ranged spell attack is the necrotic ray with a range of 60 feet. I think you'd need a much greater range to be considered sniping. The book gives very scant lore about the Draconians. They deserve more lore than what they got here. They've got seeds of interesting stories in there, but for now, you would have to turn to the Dragonlance novels or the Dragonlance campaign setting of older editions to do them more justice. They do have pretty cool abilities and aesthetics, and they fill an interesting niche between true dragons and the humanoid dragonborn. In fact, they came before the dragonborn did in D&D's history, but alas, they've been pushed aside. Dragonborn champions are another two-page section of NPCs. They are dragonborn who have immense spiritual connections with dragon gods, and they wield fantastic powers as their heroes. The champion of Tiamat, also called Talon of Tiamat, is a kind of advanced cultist dragon warrior with a once per day legendary resistance, a breath weapon that deals necrotic damage and frightens the target, and a great axe that deals an extra 3d8 necrotic damage on every single hit, which begs the same questions that I had with the chosen dragon follower. How is the CR7 NPC getting this huge damage boost? I embrace the design philosophy that NPCs should have abilities and special features that player characters do not have. What I don't embrace is NPCs gaining special abilities that are way stronger than anything a player character can ever gain without any balancing factor or at least some lore or explanation that backs it up. The Tiamat champion doesn't spend an action praying to get this damage enhancement for a certain duration. He doesn't cast a spell to temporarily imbue the weapon, so on. It's just always active. Also, how is necrotic damage associated with Tiamat? Shouldn't it be chromatic dragon damage types? I don't want to rag on this NPC too hard because it does function well for what it's intended to be. And with a bit of DM creativity, the awkward bits could be smoothed out. The final draconian in the ranking, and the one that I find to be the best, is the Mastermind. It's also the rarest and most powerful of draconians. It comes from eggs of red, gold, or amethyst dragons. They are advisors, military strategists, and arcanists of respectable power. They have a noxious breath that deals poison damage and inflicts a level of exhaustion. And when they die, they implode into an arcing ball of lightning that deals lightning damage and can stun the targets. This continues with a strange draconian tendency to deal damage types not associated with the colors of the originating dragon eggs. It can attack with claws or an energy ray spell attack that deals force damage, and it has a few interesting spells such as invisibility, dimension door, and disguise self. Also, it has a three times per day magic shield ability, which is similar to the shield spell, but not quite as good. And now we come to the sea serpent. It's really cool to come across a sea serpent monster in here, 
such a classic and well-known monster from mythology, from culture. The book only features the young and the ancient sea serpent, not wormling nor adult, which is odd. It's overall a very nice creature, though doesn't exactly reach awesomeness in any area except for style. It's what you would expect. A massive deep sea terror that swims, sinks ships, and eats people. It also has a rhyme breath that deals cold damage, and the ancient variety has a couple legendary resistances and legendary actions. It's just a plain old cool monster. I'm glad it was finally included. It's such a classic creature, and yet somehow it always gets left out of the core monster manuals. Next up, we have the Ghost Dragon. I really wanted to rate this creature higher in the ranking, as I love the concept and the aesthetic, but it does have a few issues. Mid B tier is still pretty good, yes, but the potential here is certainly for something higher. Anyhow, take what you know and love about both ghosts and dragons and put them together. We have a restless, undead spirit that haunts its horde and lair. A perfect creature for both role-playing scenes and combat. It has incorporeal movement, three legendary resistances, a bite that deals cold damage and slows the target, claws that deal necrotic damage, and a breath attack that deals cold damage and frightens the target, which becomes paralyzed with terror. Strangely, the breath attack only features a constitution saving throw. How weird is that? Your physical toughness determines if your mind is scared. Why couldn't they have made it two saving throws? I don't think that's so far-fetched. You do con against the cold damage and wisdom against the fear and paralysis effect. Or maybe it could have been wisdom against psychic damage plus fear. Or even better than that, make the fear effect its own frightening presence, like what a lot of dragons normally have, and it can use the frightening presence before the breath attack, or before its bite plus claws. Another bizarre point is that the ghost dragon is immune to acid, cold, necrotic, and poison, but not even resistant to fire, lightning, and thunder. That's how the other incorporeal creatures are, such as ghosts and specters, and what if it's the ghost of a red dragon? It somehow loses that key characteristic of its essence? A further letdown is how the lore says that the breath weapon carries an otherworldly curse, but there is no curse anywhere to be found in the stat block. So that would have been cool if they would have remembered to put that in there. This is another monster that would have functioned better as a template, something that we could apply to practically any dragon, along with an example ghost dragon in there too, that would have served DMs much better than just giving us this one single CR-17 creature. I love the core idea, the look, the tone, the RP and storytelling potential, but the entry in the book, as is, falls short in certain ways. Alongside the Dragonborn Champion of Tiamat are the Champions of Bahamut, God of Metallic Dragons, and the champion of Sardior, god of gem dragons, who was supposedly slain during the destruction of the first world, which according to this book was the original world of the material plane. It was inhabited by dragons. Then along came the other gods with their humanoids and a cosmic war ensued. This origin story is pretty cool, I would say, but it seems weird to only talk about it now, eight years into the edition. Something so fundamental should have been at the beginning of the core books, or really what it should have been is the Genesis story for a specific campaign setting, not a default for the whole of the Dungeons and Dragons game. Anyhow, the Champion of Bahamut and the Champion of Sardior are basically neck and neck for me. They beat out the Champion of Tiamat just by one point in the mechanics area. The Bahamut Champion can fly, has a blinding longsword attack, and a healing touch like that of Paladin. Also, he has a radiant breath weapon that can heal allies while harming the enemies. And another thing that he has is a once per day legendary resistance. The same as the champion of Sardior. He has psionic powers. That's an icon of gym dragons, by the way. These powers provide flight without wings and gym chunks orbiting around his head. Wowee. The Sardior champion actions are quite nice though with a triple attack Mind Blade, a breath that deals fire damage and heats up metal, sort of like the spell Heat Metal, and he has innate psionic spells like Big B's Hand, Hypnotic Pattern, and Telekinesis, all of which are great control spells. 
Now we come to the Hollow Dragon. It is a metallic dragon that has become an undead for the sake of some sort of noble purpose, such as protecting an important location or item, or maybe fulfilling some great vow that it made in life. It appears as an armor-like metal shell filled inside with celestial flames, lightning, or mist. It's a high CR-18 monster with three uses of legendary resistance, bite and claw attacks, much like a standard dragon, a sapping presence that slows enemies and imposes disadvantage on their attack rolls, a radiant breath attack, and legendary actions, which include extra claw attacks, ethereal binding that restrains a target, and booming scales, a 10-foot radius blast of thunder damage. In addition, when the hollow dragon is slain, its nine metallic body parts fall to the ground, and after 1d6 days, all these parts teleport together, restoring the hollow dragon. Except the parts can just easily be destroyed. They're just simply objects with AC 19 and 27 hit points. And if even one of them is destroyed, the hollow dragon cannot reform. Meh. This creature reminds me of the Eidolon from Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. A non-evil or most likely non-evil undead, which is not powered by the negative energy plane nor necromantic magic. I like this concept, but again, the lore drops the ball on how this actually takes place. What is going on here? It just flies in the face of liches and dracoliches that go through such pain and toil to achieve undeath. They take such risks to perform the harrowing rite of transformation. In the case of the hollow dragon, the lore makes it seem easy, as though the dragon just transforms into a hollow because it wants to. Now I want to be clear, I don't think that every little detail has to be explained. Sometimes it is better to leave things mysterious in the realm of the unknown. But the writer has to make a commitment one way or the other, then develop things in sync with the chosen approach. Otherwise it ends up with an unsatisfying compromise where it provokes our questions of how come, but does not answer in a satisfactory way. This is also yet another creature that should have been a template instead of just sticking us with the one specimen. It's an interesting monster to be sure and I really wish I had a way to easily make hollow dragons of my own. So if it had some shoring up in those areas, I would have rated it higher in this ranking. Our next entry is the Eidrake, a peculiar creature. Beholders and dragons are bound to come into conflict with one another. When a beholder's mind becomes preoccupied with a dragon enemy so much that it obsesses over the dragon, an Eidrake can manifest out of the beholder's own nightmares. It resembles something of a wormling but in a larva form, with an eyeball sprouting from its mouth and additional eyes on stalks that also form into wing-like appendages, though I don't believe it actually flaps the pseudo-wings in order to fly. Rather, it magically hovers like a beholder. And wait, it's not wormling or hatchling size, it's actually large size. Oh, I did not get that impression from the art. Plus, beholders themselves are large size. Hmm, okay. Style here has potential, I just don't care for the simplistic poppy look. Anyhow, the Eidrake has a cone of anti-magic breath that is actually more like dispel magic breath, and it does have a saving throw, constitution, oddly enough. It's paired with force damage, so I guess it kind of fits. And in true beholder kin fashion, it fires eye rays. In this case, three random eye rays from a list of six. Freezing, debilitating, repulsion, fire, paralysis, and death. This is an interesting creature, I have to say. Beholder can tend to be pretty cool monsters, and it's nice to see a couple aberrations making it into this book. So, B tier concludes here, and in fact, things are gonna jump from mid B tier right into mid A tier. So brace yourself for some draconic greatness. And here we have another aberration, the Elder Brain Dragon. That's right, Elder Brain as in the high-powered mastermind at the center of an illithid colony. Just as it's inevitable that dragons will come into conflict with beholders, it's also inevitable that they will come into conflict with illithids, aka mind flayers. If they manage to capture the dragon, 
the elder brain can latch onto it, dig its tendrils into the dragon's body and brain, and become a mobile, flying fusion creature of a very high CR-22. It has four legendary resistances, a siege monster trait that makes it devastating against structures and objects, a multi-attack of a bite, claws, and grappling tentacles. Its breath weapon is a stream of brine filled with illithid tadpoles, which deals psychic damage, and whether or not the creature succeeds or fails on its con save, it becomes infested with the tadpoles. An infested creature takes psychic damage at the start of each of its turns, and if it drops to zero hit points, its body remains stable while the tadpoles transform it into a mind flayer over the next day or two. The Elder Brain Dragon also has legendary actions in the form of additional tentacle attacks and a shatter concentration that targets a creature that the Brain Dragon is grappling, automatically ending the subject's concentration on spells and dealing psychic damage to it. I like the idea of an aberration mutated dragon, especially illithid mutated, as that's what they do to everyone. But having it be literally an elder brain riding around fused to the back of a dragon and no longer needing to be in its brain pool is a little lore breaking. It removes the usual drawbacks or limitations of an elder brain without replacing them with any new drawbacks, which is a sure way to cheapen a creature. But other than these nitpicks, this is a damn cool monster. Next, we come across the Dragon Turtle, a creature that was already in the monster manual, but it's been expanded upon here in Fizban's treasury. It's a creature that I find really easy to like. Yes, the traditional flying dragons are more iconic, but the Dragon Turtle is cool in its own way. It's somehow more bestial and less pretentious. It also consistently gets good artwork, which helps too. The Dragon Turtle image in the Monster Manual has a great classic fantasy style and it's grounded in reality. The Dragon Turtle images in Fizban's Treasury are more epic and stylized, but still really nice to look at. This book gives us Dragon Turtles in the age categories of Wormling, Young, and Ancient, with the one already in the Monster Manual serving as the adult. The Ancient Dragon Turtle here is a mythic monster of CR 24 that's like a living island. Mythic creatures are a newer thing in 5e. I have mixed feelings about them. They have legendary actions, as we all know, and once a mythic creature's hit points would reach zero, its hit points reset back to full, or at least to a much higher amount. It regains some of its abilities, and it gains access to mythic legendary actions for one hour. It's somewhat innovative and dynamic, which is interesting, but it's also somewhat gimmicky and video game-like, as though a boss monster who takes on his final form. There is also a lore aspect about mythic creatures that I don't particularly care for. According to the canon lore now, D&D exists in a multiverse where there are several worlds across the material plane, and powerful creatures have echoes of themselves, versions of themselves that coexist simultaneously on a number of these different worlds. When it comes to dragons, the great worm category are those most powerful and largest of dragons who have merged with or consumed many of their echoes. That's uh, not my thing. I like each D&D setting to be its own self-contained cosmology and lore, not this web of worlds as though Magic the Gathering where you could planeswalk from Forgotten Realms over to Eberron, over to Greyhawk, to Dark Sun, to Spelljammer, to Ravenloft. Stats-wise, a dragon turtle is an amphibious swimming dragon with bite, claw, and tail attacks. I was thinking it was a siege monster, but apparently it's not. It also has steam breath and a boiling aura. These deal fire damage even through water. The ancient variety has an Armor of Storms mythic action that gives the Dragon Turtle temporary hit points and deals lightning damage to creatures that touch it or hit it with melee attacks. It does not have any spell casting and is overall a little simpler than the main dragons. But don't forget to check out the lore section in the book, which gives the Dragon Turtle a bunch of expanded info, random tables, though unfortunately no layer map. We now come to the Gem Dragons. There are a lot of great aspects to the Gem Dragons, and it's so nice to finally get them back in an official book. Really, the thing that holds them back is their style. They should have received 
beautiful, powerful, menacing looks with well-rendered details, just like all the core dragons have received. It's really hard to go from this, with all of its prestige and power and high level of detail, to this. I want to be clear that I'm not taking a stab at the artists here. I'm sure they were following the guidelines they were given for the job, and there's nothing wrong with the illustrations in and of themselves. But for whatever reason, the art direction on this book decided to go with sketchy or concept art looks for the main Jim Dragon art, or they went with these cartoon or video game dragons. Bright colors, fun and simple shapes, and the insistence on these floating bits of gems. Now, of course, the designers wanted the gem dragons to look distinct from the chromatics and the metallics, and that's fine, they should do that. But they went so far that it almost looks like art from a different game. This contrast is obvious even within the book itself. The first half or so has dragon art like this, compared to this with the gem dragons in the latter half. In fact, most of these deeper, more detailed and serious illustrations come from the Magic the Gathering set, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Of course, Wizards of the Coast owns both brands, and I'm totally cool with the same art being used on both Magic cards and D&D books. Really, my only issue is just that the style choices with the Gem Dragons don't inspire me. They don't make me spend a long time relishing and appreciating the awe-inspiring terrifying, gorgeous beings that dragons are supposed to be. On a positive note, on a very positive note at that, there is an amazing dragon lore section that comes before the bestiary. It has expanded dragon lore for all the gem dragons, chromatic dragons, metallic dragons, dragon turtles, and a couple other dragons that you'll see in here soon. Along with the info are some great random tables to add role-playing, and storytelling and extra details and personality with the dragons and the excellent dragon layer maps drawn by Dyson Logos are really nice. This lore and layers section really is what solidifies Fizban's treasury of dragons, and it's probably my favorite thing about the book. If it had not been for this section though, the gem dragons would have landed in high B tier. So let's take a look at the five gem dragons, which I essentially rate all on the same level like other true dragons, they have four age categories, wormling, young, adult, and ancient. They all bite, claw, fly, resist, or are immune to their associated damage types, and they get legendary actions and legendary resistance once they hit the adult age category. Furthermore, they all have a few psionic spells. It's cool seeing the spells right in the stat block, as the spellcasting aspect of dragons in the monster manual can get overlooked. The Sapphire Dragon is lawful neutral and typically dwells in deep, far-reaching caverns. It is a militaristic or war-oriented dragon. Of course, all dragons are creatures of combat and violence, but the Sapphire particularly has a strategic, campaigning disposition, and it is extremely fierce when it comes to the question of territory. Its breath deals thunder damage, and incapacitates creatures that fail their saves. Its spells are things like Dissonant Whispers, Hold Person, and Meld into Stone. It can change shape as a bonus action, becoming any medium or small creature, though it otherwise retains its game statistics. I like the change shape concept as a whole, but it seems a little bit off, like the dragon could appear as a baby cow, but still bite, claw, breath attack, fly, cast spells, uh, or it could take the shape of a gallop doer and just appear as a rock on the ground, yet with all of its dragon attacks and powers still. There should have been a little more stipulation and detail to the mechanics of the shape change. The Sapphire Dragon also has a bonus action 60-foot teleport, and a legendary action of telekinetic fling that it uses to throw objects at its foes. For layer actions, it can release a stunning blast of thunder, beguile a creature with a charming whisper, or open a tunnel through stone. The Crystal Dragon dwells in cold wastelands, building castle-like layers out of snow and ice. Alas, it doesn't make a lot of sense for them to be living in remote, frigid, inhospitable environments, as they are described as being so cheerful, friendly, 
They're really caring and welcoming type of dragons. It's because they have an innate psionic connection to the positive plane. They're brimming with life, yet they dwell in very desolate areas. They're highly optimistic and nurturing, yet their alignment is chaotic neutral. When I think of chaotic neutral, I think of Conan, Han Solo, at least in A New Hope, Catwoman, Khal Drogo, Sandor Clegane, Oberyn Martell, Jack Sparrow, Tyler Durden, The Mask, Beetlejuice. They are the tricksters, the wild cards, rebels, hedonists, wanderers. They do not prey upon the innocent like evil characters will, but they also don't go out of their way to be charitable or compassionate. They just follow their own ideas or their own whims. They serve their own interests. They're the scoundrels and rogues, the mavericks and berserkers, not nurturing caregivers. So statistics wise, the crystal dragon has a scintillating breath that deals radiant damage and grants the dragon temporary hit points. The same shape change and short range teleportation as the sapphire dragon and psionic spells like divination, hypnotic pattern, and restoration. It also has a legendary action called starlight strike that is a single target blast of radiance. Its layer actions are a charming whisper, an ice passage that opens a tunnel, and an area of effect radiant damage plus fairy fire. Like with all the true dragons, the mechanics and the lore side of things are where the crystal dragon really shines. The topaz dragon is connected to the negative plane. It is thus an embodiment of entropy, decay, and death. They are chaotic neutral in alignment as well, which actually makes sense this time. Their preferred environments are sea caves, estuaries, and salt marshes, particularly where the waves or the water are slowly eroding away the land. Topaz dragons are gloomy, somber, morbid creatures, though not actually malevolent. The art does look more like an amber dragon, though. Apparently, pure topaz is actually colorless, but impurities often mix with it, causing shades of blue, pink, yellow, or orange. This is actually the first artwork I came across when I looked at Thisban's Treasury of Dragons, and I thought that it was like the secondary piece that we sometimes get alongside the main piece, something that's more loose or sketchy or like a concept art style. How we go from this in the middle of the book to this at the closing is a mystery to me. Again, I'm not knocking the artist's work. It just seems like the book gave us concept art instead of fully rendered engrossing pieces. In terms of unique abilities, the Topaz Dragon has a desiccating breath that deals necrotic damage and inflicts a weakened state that imposes disadvantage on strength checks and saves and strength-based weapon attacks deal half damage. I have to wonder why this weakened condition doesn't affect all weapon attacks, but rather just the strength ones. If you were to try using a bow and arrow while in a weakened state, it would be just as much of a hindrance. The Topaz Dragon has the same chain shape and teleport abilities, which I quickly realized that they gave to all the gym dragons, so mm, I suppose that's fine. It has a legendary action that deals single target necrotic damage, which reduces the target to dust if its hit points reach zero. And in terms of spell casting, it has spells like Fabricate, Bane, Create or Destroy Water, and Control Water. The Topaz Dragon's layer actions include that same charming whisper that we keep seeing, an automatic dispel of a fifth level or lower spell that's active anywhere in the layer, and a negative energy infusion that deals some necrotic damage to two targets and prevents any healing within the layer for a round. Moving along, we have the Emerald Dragon. They are lawful neutral and dwell in volcanoes, lava tubes, and deep cave networks in warm regions of the world. They're very shy beings and they're filled with curiosity. They want to observe anything and everything. They favor using manipulation, subterfuge, and illusions. Though of course, they can bring extreme force to bear if needed. An emerald dragon can tunnel through solid rock and it has magical abilities all about warping perception and misleading foes or granting invisibility. Its disorienting breath deals psychic damage and imposes a negative 1d6 penalty on the subject's attacks and ability checks for a round. It has a legendary action as well called Emerald Embers and is a plain single target fire damage effect with a dex save for half damage. 
The Emerald Dragon's layer actions include that same Charming Whisper, a single target psychic damage effect that imposes disadvantage on the target's saving throws for a round, and a one round invisibility effect for the dragon. The artwork for the Emerald Dragon is actually more fleshed out, it's more rendered, so that's nice, but it still has that kids cartoon or modern video game look to it. Keep in mind that these floating crystals change position depending upon the dragon's facial expression and mood. So they'll droop down like a sad puppy dog ears, or vibrate at the sides in anger, or leap straight up like exclamation points from surprise. Bleh. Last but not least is the Amethyst Dragon. I suppose they're my favorite gym dragons, though I'm probably a little bit biased because I love the color purple. Amethyst is my favorite stone, and in fact, I always have a little amethyst obelisk standing by my dice when I DM. Saying all that, the Amethyst Dragon art is possibly the most cartoonish of the bunch, so it's not like this guy is winning by much more than a pixel. Amethyst Dragons are neutral aligned and spend much of their time studying and experimenting with the natural laws of the universe. It's somewhat scientific, though it has that fantasy magic element in which the dragon is bending the constants and forces of reality for its own pursuits. Amethyst dragons are considered the mightiest and most majestic of the gem dragons, and this reflects in their lofty, cosmological interests. They are amphibious dragons who dwell in caves beneath lakes and pools, and they always include some sort of underwater tunnel in their layers. Their singularity breath weapon deals force damage and can reduce a subject's speed to zero for a round. They have an explosive crystal legendary action in which they spit a gemstone that bursts in a large radius dealing force damage and potentially knocking creatures prone. An Amethyst Dragon's psionic spells are things like Protection from Evil and Good, Unseen Servant, Blink, Dispel Magic, and Control Water. Layer actions are that Charming Whisper, the amazingly strong Force Cage spell, and the incredibly unique Spatial Projection in which the dragon exists in two places within the layer at the same time. I particularly found that very interesting. So the gym dragons as a bunch are solid. They're great, really. If you can get past the disappointing aesthetics and their few wacky spots here and there, they have a lot to offer to your game. They comprise a whole other subgroup of dragons, a third branch of true dragons, and they haven't seen publication since 3E. Again, the dragon lore section of the book is really what seals them in their greatness. So don't skip over that. It's just so refreshing to see some 5e monsters get big servings of lore goodies. It's not been since Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes in 2018 that monsters got this kind of love. Welcome back, Jim Dragons. It's so good to see you returned. Delving down even further through the caverns, we come across the Deep Dragon. One thing that disappointed me about Fizban's treasury is that it did not include the rarer chromatic and metallic dragons. I'm talking about things like the Iron Dragon, Brown Dragon, Gray Dragon, Cobalt Dragon, and Purple Dragon. But then I came across the Deep Dragon in Fizban's Treasury, which essentially is the Purple Dragon. That's always been another way to refer to it. It's something of a reboot of the Purple. The monster's appearance has definitely a new design here. It now has no scales, but rather this white, gray, and black skin. It has pale eyes, a new head shape, and fungus growing on its body. Whereas the purple dragon was a far-ranging underdark explorer, the deep dragon is an underdark hoarder of knowledge and secrets. They're still neutral evil, crafty manipulators, so that aspect remains intact. A deep dragon has the bite, claws, and tail slam that we're used to with the dragons, and it has that same chain shape ability that the gym dragons do, even though the deep dragon is more related to chromatics. Its Nightmare Breath is a spore cloud that deals psychic damage and inflicts fear. This is also similar to what the Purple Dragon had. Its layer actions include a Tail Slam, a single target commanding spore effect that causes the subject to attack a creature of the dragon's choice, and a single target poisonous spores effect. Its layer actions are the Slow Spell, a mossy sludge that turns an area into difficult terrain for one round, and a cloud of poisonous spores. As before, don't miss the expanded dragon lore section for more info and random tables for deep dragons. 
I'm not completely sold on the Deep Dragon, and I do find myself wishing it would have been two different creatures, the one being the actual purple dragon, and then the other one could have been some kind of fungus dragon, like a creepy fungal thing that overtook a sleeping dragon, transforming it into a gruesome plant creature. Plus, that would have given us a plant monster in this book, which is lacking plants. I would have liked that better than the compromise that we had to get. That said, the Deep Dragon is genuinely good. Uh, I could absolutely see myself using one in a campaign. Tremble in awe, mortal, for you now behold the goddess Tiamat, mother of chromatic dragons, queen of avarice and strife. She is a colossal, vicious, rampaging dragon deity with five heads, one of each of the five classic chromatic dragons. Each head has its own mannerisms, though all of them are Tiamat. In 5e lore, she has been imprisoned in hell since the dawn of time, when the celestial gods sealed her away there. As we see explained in Fizban's treasury, the world was originally created by Tiamat and Bahamut, the two original dragon gods. But then the other gods came, the gods from the outer planes, with their humanoid followers, and a great war ensued, which resulted in Bahamut's death, though his spirit went on to dwell upon Mount Celestia with the celestial gods, and um, Tiamat got imprisoned. Oh, also, before all this happened, Bahamut and Tiamat created Sardior, the psionic ruby dragon god who was shattered in that same war of gods. I really wish this lore would have been for its own campaign setting instead of trying to retcon it now that we're eight years into 5e. It's a massive implication for an edition whose core books are supposed to stay setting agnostic. There's a lot I could say about Tiamat. She's a dragon goddess, terrifying, immense, and powerful beyond mortal understanding. Yet there is an allure to the might and the wealth she promises. In rare circumstances, dragon cultists or other ambitious souls can provide a substantial enough sacrifice as part of a great ritual and invoke an aspect of Tiamat into the world. At CR 30, the aspect seems to bear the goddess's full power, or at least a great deal of it. She has five instances of legendary resistance, she has legendary actions, and that mythic creature final form type of ability. Her bite attacks strangely deal force damage instead of the damage types associated with the different chromatic dragons, though she does have a mind-blowing 300-foot cone breath attack. It deals 11 d12s of a chromatic dragon damage type of her choice. One of her mythic actions is called Hurl Through Avernus, which if the target fails a charisma save, it takes 8 d10 psychic damage and is banished the first layer of hell for one round. Personally, I dislike one-round banishment effects, as it doesn't make much sense to fling someone through the cosmos to another plane, all for them just to come back in six seconds. Maybe the idea is that Tiamat is supposed to sustain the effect every round, with the creature remaking its saving throw to try to pull itself back? I don't know. Tiamat, stat block and all, was already published in Horde of the Dragon Queen. She is CR 30 there, Yet, her aspect is also CR 30. Tiamat, as in the full goddess in Horde of the Dragon Queen, has Legendary Resistance 5 and limited magic immunity. Unless she wishes to be affected by a spell, Tiamat is immune to spells of 6th level and lower, and she has advantage on saving throws against all other spells and magical effects. Yet, her aspect does not have even just regular magic resistance though it does recharge all five legendary resistances with that final form mythic ability. One glaring issue with Tiamat's aspect is that she lacks a frightful presence ability. All adult and older chromatic dragons have frightful presence, yet the chromatic dragon goddess does not. I can only assume that this was an oversight. The aspect of Tiamat is such a tremendous force to behold, really incredible in many ways. I just don't care for the big changes to the lore and the design approach this far into the edition. I imagine this is supposed to be ramping us up into 5.5 edition that's coming up in 2024, but I'm not being won over by these changes. Anyhow, Tiamat is awesome in her own way, 
and the full page illustration is outstanding. Really such a gem that helps seal this entry into high A tier. Speaking of tiers and big changes, I really wish that I would have included an S tier in these monster rankings from the beginning. I've been including S tiers in my class rankings and I really think it is the way to go. So why not start featuring an S tier in a dragon ranking? I might go back and make a video talking about which prior monsters uh, would be an S tier for my older rankings as there are a number of them. So here we go, the cream of the crop, the prized jewel of the horde, the best of the best when it comes to Fizban's treasury of dragons. In low S tier is the Draconic Shard, a unique type of undead dragon. It's a specter-like being that results from the immense psionic power of a gem dragon's mind and will. It often inhabits an item from the dragon's hoard, such as a weapon or magic item. If this dragon spirit or whatever item it's inside of is destroyed, it transforms into a cracked gemstone in which it regains its strength over 120 days, unless that gemstone is destroyed. <clears throat> I do wish the artwork would have been a little better for this creature, but its overall style and tone are really interesting. They're pretty unique. I love how this creature can present itself as a sentient magic item, interact with the characters in all kinds of ways, and carry out its wishes and plots to whatever design. The Draconic Shard has a number of different actions and abilities, from incorporeal movement and legendary resistance, to a telekinetic rend spell attack that functions in both melee and ranged combat. The rules for its inhabit object ability are robust while being easy to follow. It can even grant benefits to a character who is using that object, an extra 1d8 force damage on attacks, and resistance to psychic damage. It has a psychic crush ability that is a massive 60 foot radius. It's a DC 20 intelligence saving throw that deals 10d10 psychic damage and stuns targets. Oof. Also, the Draconic Shard can cast Detect Thoughts, Invisibility, and Telekinesis at will, lending further to its role playing exploration, and combat aspects. And it has legendary actions, including a command ability that turns a creature into its puppet for a turn. This is a unique, complex, and compelling monster, and I look forward to using it at some point. I could have rated it even higher, as you could argue that I should have given it a 5 in the lore attribute and have it share all the wonderful expanded lore of whatever gem dragon that it was in life. But I chose not to since the Draconic Shard is very different from what a living gem dragon is, truly becoming its own creature, even if it still operates with the personality and goals of its former self. The final four creatures of this ranking are all mid S tier creatures, wonderful entries that are nearly neck and neck with each other. The Moonstone Dragon is not gem, chromatic, nor metallic, even though its name would lead you to believe that it is related to gem dragons. I suspect that it probably is distantly related to them in the same way that the deep dragon is now considered to be a cousin of the chromatic dragons. But the Moonstone dragons kind have dwelt within the Feywild for so long that really they've become something else entirely, something unique unto itself. As its lore states, when the celestial gods warred against the dragon gods of the first world, a certain dragon fled to the plain of fairy to hide its clutch of eggs. That led to the origin of this fey dragon. They are neutral aligned, mischievous, and playful. They have opalescent scales and two horns that create a crescent moon shape from its forehead down to the tip of its snout. Given their wandering ways and flights of fancy, they typically create multiple layers, even going so far as to link them together with magic portals. They love all kinds of sights, from open glades to isolated mountains or lakes, anywhere that receives abundant direct moonlight. A Moonstone Dragon's breath weapon has two modes, a dream breath that renders creatures unconscious and a searing moonbeam of radiant damage. I'm a little skeptical of the second option there as it seems more like a sunbeam given how direct and powerful it is. The dragon's spells tend to include things like fairy fire calm emotions, and invisibility. Its legendary actions are additional claw attacks or spells, and its layer actions are a compulsive dance, which should have stipulated that it's a charm effect, 
Disorienting Visions, which can impose disadvantage on enemies' ability checks, and Banish into a Dream, which is a one-round banishment effect plus stun. Quite strong, but again, I'm not a big fan of hurtling creatures into other planes of existence only for a mere six seconds. Despite my nitpicks, the layer actions are pretty cool and they do fit the Moonstone Dragon's flavor. Next up, we have the Great Worms, which harken back to older editions of D&D in which there was a final age and size category for dragons, the Great Worm. These are incredibly strong dragons, the oldest and mightiest ones of all, approaching godhood in terms of power level. When looking at a Great Worm, I'm essentially just treating it as an advanced version of the base dragon with all the lore and associated aspects, as that's what it is. So naturally, they're going to rank incredibly high. I do have a few quibbles about them, such as how they can easily lead into obnoxiousness if not handled with sufficient maturity or at least some good storytelling to earn them their places. My misgivings as well extend to the whole multiverse approach that features the echo duplicates of greater beings across various worlds and the Great Worms supposedly fuse their echoes together into one mega dragon. The Great Worms all have that final form ability in which they go from zero back to full hit points or at least a really high amount of hit points and they refresh their legendary actions and unlock additional abilities. The Gym Great Worm has a bite attack with extra force damage, claws that grapple, an enormous breath weapon of force damage that also knocks creatures prone, but oddly no tail slam attack. Its spells are Dispel Magic, Force Cage, Plane Shift, Reverse Gravity, and Time Stop. So very intense spells there. It has the chain shape and 60 foot teleportation like all Gym Dragons do, and its legendary actions are a claw attack, spell casting, and a psychic beam that deals psychic damage to creatures in the beam's area. When it's in its final form, the Great Worm can use a one-time mass telekinesis effect. It has no duration, nor does it require concentration. So if a creature cannot achieve a DC 26 strength save, it can just be forever held in orbit about the gym dragon. Not even knocking the dragon unconscious ends it. The lore sidebar of this entry states that there are five gym great worms, each one from one of the five kinds of gym dragon. They are all seeking to unite their multiverse echoes together, then merge all of themselves to finally reform Sardior, the ruby dragon god of yore. I do have to wonder though, would this actually be a good move? A gym great worm is CR 26 and an epic being of power and means. Would Sardior alone be greater than having all of these gem Great Worms in existence? Continuing on, we have the Chromatic Great Worm, which has all the hallmarks of the Chromatic Dragons that we know from the Monster Manual. The bite, the claws, the tail slaps, the wing attacks, the iconic breath attacks, but it's all cranked up in power to a CR-27. It also has an Arcane Spear legendary action, which is like a high-powered magic missile. It also unlocks mythic legendary actions when it enters its final form. These include additional bite attacks and a chromatic flare, which is a colossal 60 foot radius burst of damage that centers on the dragon. The chromatic great worms are epic beings over 1200 years in age with hordes containing values in the range of millions of gold pieces. They're like elemental titans or behemoths of apocalypse. One potential difficulty in implementing it into a standard D&D combat encounter, in practical terms, is that it has to take up a massive amount of space. I don't know what it would be, 10 by 10 squares on a battle grid? 20 by 20 squares? Maybe even more. Look at the art. It's like the size of a whole town. Its breath weapon can destroy whole chunks of city districts at once. Not to mention that it could just smash the buildings like Godzilla. This is a rabbit hole of questions as to how exactly something like this could exist without destroying all of civilization. But in true 5e style, the books just assume that we can come up with reasons. The metallic great worm takes what we know and love from dragons like silver, gold, and copper and raises them to an incredible CR 28. Mechanically, it's not all that different than the chromatic great worm. 
except that it has an alternate breath weapon that knocks creatures unconscious on a failed save. And even on a success, it still imposes disadvantage on attacks and saves for a round. For a mythic action, it has a shattering roar that deals thunder damage to creatures and can incapacitate them, but it doesn't actually shatter anything. We also get here a neat sidebar which mentions two silver great worms, Lindus and Tamara, which I can only assume are the shortened versions of their names that are actually something like Lindusalion Monselthacor and Tamarachus Cravesticais. Both of them are like Exarchs or Exalted of Bahamut, and Lindus is a lawful neutral arbiter who brings harsh justice to wrongdoers, especially evil chromatic dragons. Ooh, uh, maybe there's the counterbalance to the chromatic great worm, huh? huh? Tamara is a lawful good, or maybe even neutral good, and she is an embodiment of mercy and compassion, and is there to guide dying dragons onto the afterlife. So are the great worms a good addition to the game? Well, they've basically always been there, so it's just that we now have official stats for them. You do have to be very careful in how they get used, as they could disrupt a campaign setting very badly. I would be tempted to not actually have them in the world or on the material plane, but rather in an outer plane of their own, like a massive dragon battleground plane, and the highest level characters could have interplanar adventures there. Sitting upon his glorious throne at the top of this ranking is Bahamut, or rather the aspect of Bahamut. While he is CR 30, the same as the aspect of Tiamat, I find that he works for me a little bit better than she does. For one, I find his abilities slightly more interesting, with his choice of either a radiant damage breath or a platinum breath that heals allies and revivifies the fallen. He can also change shape into a beast or a humanoid, such as Fizban the Fabulous, and venture more freely into the world, pursuing various goals and altogether striving to aid mortals in the complicated task of keeping civilization from coming apart at the seams or falling into the endless pits of corruption. Bahamut is the divine essence of the greatest of metallic dragon ideals. He is known as the Platinum Dragon, a lawful good deity of justice, courage, honor, and glory. According to our brand new lore, he and Tiamat created the first world, and when it was sieged by the celestial gods or outer plane gods, he either died or fled. There's conflicting verbiage in different parts of this book, but whatever occurred in that somewhat wonky creation myth, Bahamut came to dwell in the seven heavens of Mount Celestia, along with other gods such as Kord, god of strength, and Moradin, god of dwarves. Much like with the silver dragon that topped off my first dragon's ranking video, Bahamut represents something so compelling, so heroic, the grand quest to rise above the plight of existence and reach for greatness. While we often fall short of such greatness, our struggle to overcome the darkness both inside and outside makes for really good stories. So, my brave companions, here they are the monsters and NPCs of Fizben's Treasury of Dragons. There are some great ones, some not so great ones, and everything in between. We're seeing hints of changes to come in D&D. 5.5 is how most people are referring to it. I'm not sold on it, not yet at least, but we'll see. It's hard to take too hard of a stance before we even really know what the deal is. What I can say for now is that certain trends I'm observing do not seem to be for the betterment of the game. A cartoonish style, simpler and simpler design approaches, video gaming mechanics, and this multiverse cosmology as though it were Magic the Gathering or the Marvel Cinematic Universe. My concern is that these issues will lead to the game losing meaning and losing its identity. These problems all hurt the world building and the storytelling. And if the game world is not built well, then we don't really know why we're adventuring to begin with. Now, Dungeons and Dragons is a very creative game, and it gives all of us a lot of freedom to play how we want, in whatever setting we want. This is a great thing, but only to a certain extent. Anything can go too far and collapse or implode. D&D's deepest roots extend through war games with crunchy rules, 
then on through the great classics of fantasy literature and mythology, then all the way into medieval and ancient history. We turn our backs on that to our peril. I'm not saying that there's no room for whimsy and comedy, or that we shouldn't make our own new creatures and new worlds. I'm not saying that at all. I'm also not against the game being accessible to a wide audience. But if the game becomes too commercialized, too oversimplified, and too politically correct, it will shatter into a thousand mucky fragments, and the players, who used to be part of a grand heroic legacy, will become mere consumers. I, for one, am not willing to turn my back on the deep and impassioned roots of D&D and tabletop role-playing in general. My torch yet burns, and I hold it aloft despite the thorns and bogs along the way. The soul of mythic storytelling will not die out, not on my watch. I will tell the stories of old, and bow in respect to the great heroes of yore who risked it all for the benefit of future generations. May we aspire to do them honor with our own pursuits, and may our adventures be many. Mm -hmm.